Uh, if you've watched television, if you've watched NCIS, if you've watched uh, any of the, the, the crime shows, uh, you know occasionally they will focus on some of the, uh, the more uh, macabre aspects of, uh, uh, of crime scene analysis. And uh, occasionally that involves uh, insect science. And you know, I always tell, uh, when I talk to a, a, an audience of, uh, of attorneys, I always say that you probably can get through uh, a perfectly good legal career and never have to employ uh, uh, insect science, if you're lucky. Uh, but if you're not, and, uh, and you need to, then it can come in uh, uh, very handy. So what we call medical criminal entomology is what I'll get around to, but I, what I want to do before we do that is to say that the field of forensic entomology uh, entails any way that uh, entomology or, or arthropod science intertwines with, uh, with the legal community. And uh, at this point in, in, in my career, uh, I find myself involved much more pests. Uh, uh, I just had a case uh, uh, down in, uh, in, in the boot heel of Missouri uh, that had to do with uh, uh, a young fellow who bought a house. What do you do under those circumstances? Well, you sue everybody. Uh, <laughs> you, you sue the real estate agent that sold you the house. You, sold, you sue the pest control company that did the, the wood destroying insect report. You sue the people who owned the house previously. And uh, so at the end of the day, uh, you know, who makes the money on that? Well, the lawyers do, of course. But this is, this is one of the ways that, uh, that, that wood-destroying insects get into uh, civil cases. Uh, negligence cases, nursing homes, hospitals. Uh, uh, I had a case recently uh, where uh, in a nursing home, uh, uh, a patient with uh, uh, advanced uh, uh, complications from diabetes had a, a, a chronic sore, and that sore was discovered uh, to be uh, infested with maggots. Oh, oh mm, this is terrible. Uh, in, in fact, it's not that big a deal. But uh, when this happens, of course, uh, you know, when it goes to court, it turns into a big deal. And the, the issue in that particular case was how long the nursing home had neglected to observe that these maggots were present. And uh, the way that worked out was, was very simple because when their expert was reminded that uh, sarcophagid flies can deposit living larvae rather than eggs and maggots can appear within a very short period of time, then that case was settled and uh, they went on to other things. Uh, nuisance cases. Uh, uh, I've been involved in many of those because my background from the university was principally in medical and veterinary entomology. So, when you have confined animal feeding operations, chicken houses, feedlots, dairy barns, things like that, flies, odors, noise, and dust are the things that people complain about. And so they sue everybody. And this is, this is a civil case of, uh, of uh, uh, either private or public nuisance, and uh, it gets litigated in either uh, 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 state or uh, federal court. Uh, spider bites, tick bites, people that allege that they've been bitten on the job by ticks or something like this. These are all civil cases. Food contamination, you wouldn't believe how many times someone will walk into a fast food restaurant, McDonald's, and they will assert that, uh, look what you sold me. This Big Mac has maggots in it. Well, uh, when that happens, what they hope is that the manager will settle and say, you know, here's $50 and go away. Uh, but if they, if they decide they're going to litigate this, then we often find out. Uh, as a matter of fact, I've, I've never had a case like that where it turns out that there was food contamination. It's almost always a, a fraud. And so uh, that probably shouldn't surprise anyone. So these civil cases are, are interesting, but what we're here to talk about today is really the field of forensic medical entomology. And my colleagues in the medical community think this is about the funniest thing they ever heard about. Uh, parasites of the dead. Now, you know, as biologists, we know that the dead don't have parasites. They have saprophytes. Uh, and the whole ecology of the decomposition process is of interest to those of us who are uh, fascinated by ecology. I mean, 
you didn't have a way to decompose dead organisms, we'd be up to our armpits and dead squirrels and raccoons. And of course, Missouri is a decay-rich environment. There's just no question about it. Uh, but the way that it's deployed to the advantage of the legal community is, is really what the subject is today. <coughs> and this is nothing new. Uh, if you would listen to uh, you know, the, the, the current uh, uh, dialogue about this, you would get the idea that this just happened yesterday. Uh, but it has been recognized for a long period of time. And as far back as we can go in history is to the famous Chinese death investigator, Sung Tzu. Uh, and that's one of the things that I always used to tell uh, uh, graduate students. Uh, and that is, uh, you know, occasionally you may be asked a question you know, like on your comprehensive exams. You may be asked a question, so where did this first become knowledge? And you may actually know the answer to that question. On the other hand, you probably don't. So if you don't, always guess China, and you'll probably <laughs> be right. Uh, and in, in, in the mid-1200s, uh, uh, Sung Tzu, who was a famous uh, uh, death investigator, uh, had to what we consider the first case which was a, a, a murder by slashing in a Chinese village. And of course, you know, when, uh, when you have a situation like this, uh, law enforcement always has two questions that come up first. Uh, when you have a dead guy, the question is, who's the dead guy? And then the next question is, how long have they been dead? So that always comes up. And so in this particular situation, Sung Tzu was confronted with trying to figure out, they knew who the dead guy was, they probably weren't too concerned about how long they'd been dead, but they were very concerned about finding out who the perpetrator was. So what he did was to call all the villagers together, and he had them bring their sickles, which they used, that was the tool they used for, for harvesting the, the, the agricultural products, bring them to the village square and put them on the ground. Stand back and see what happens. And the way the story goes, and this is, as far as we can tell, a true story, but the way the story goes is that they noticed that flies congregated on one of those sickles. Ostensibly, now, we understand because of the, the residue of blood and tissue on that sickle, but nonetheless, the story goes on to say that the, the individual who owned that sickle then broke down and confessed to the crime. So that, that is the first deployment of forensic entomology, and it's been a long time ago. Then in the middle 1800s, Dr. Bergeret, who was a physician in Paris, and at that time in the development of this arcane science, turns out that a lot of physicians were, they had an avocation of uh, uh, insect study. For whatever reason, they were fascinated by insects. And uh, a young couple had just bought a cottage on the outskirts of Paris. And they decided that they needed some renovations in the cottage. So they hired that done. And the, 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 the workforce, when they took down the mantle around the fireplace, they discovered the corpse of a baby behind it. And so the question came up, you know, who's the dead baby and how long has it been dead? And Dr. Bergeret looked at the insect specimens associated with the corpse of that baby and concluded at that time, it's been called into question since, but concluded at that time that the baby had to have been dead longer than a year. That was his professional opinion. And that was pretty handy for the young couple because they had not owned or been associated with that cottage for that length of time. So the suspicion then fell on the previous occupants of that cottage. So that was, that was useful forensically. So the question then becomes one of determination of the time of death. And I always ask, what's the best way to tell how long some, when somebody died? What's the best way? Absolutely the best way. And rather than make it a riddle, I'll just tell you, it's the medical record. If you have listed in the medical record, patient expired at 7.01 p.m. on December 1st, 2018, that's pretty ironclad evidence of when that individual died. Other than that, it becomes a question. So the next question is, who is the 
uh, the professional best qualified to answer that question. And I'll just tell you, it's a, it's a forensic pathologist. And I had students all through my career ask me, what's the best, what's the best career track for me if I want to be a forensic entomologist and earn my way? I'd say, that's very simple. What I would do, if I were you, is to take a pre-vet, pre-med curriculum, go to medical school, and get your MD degree. Then apply for and get a residency in forensic pathology at an institution where you can concurrently pursue a PhD in entomology. If you do that, then you will be fully qualified and fully employable as a forensic entomologist. All these years, I've had one student who took me up on that. <laughs> and, and, uh, and he was a good student, but he came in one day and he said, well, he said, I got bad news for you. I'm going to quit my, my program. Uh, okay, how come? I'm going to medical school. Hey, that's great. Good. So years later, I saw him, and he said, I'm getting ready to graduate from medical school. Isn't that super? And I said, yes, it is. I said, so where are you going to do your residency in forensic pathology? He said, you, you must be insane. He said, I'm going into anesthesiology. He said, that's where the money is. <laughs> so just shows. But none, nonetheless, there are various ways that you can tell how long someone has been dead. Histology, chemistry, bacteriology. Uh, there's, there's, there's forensic botany, uh, all sorts of fields come in, but zoology is one of those ways, and, and that's where, uh, where the, the forensic entomologist fits in. And it's fortunate because the entomological evidence seems to be most useful in that period post-mortem between when rigidity has passed off and when the body is in a state of advanced decomposition or putrefaction. And that, uh, th that's, that's a nice juxtaposition because it turns out that most forensic pathologists are very reluctant to guess how long a body has been dead when uh, they're just a mass of goo. Uh, you, know, you can take a guess, but most, most uh, a legitimate pathologists will say, I really can't tell. Could be weeks, could be months. I just don't know. And that's an honest answer. So if you can get it honed down, finer than that, that's great. So there's nothing magic about these timelines, but if you say death occurs at time zero, then seven or eight hours later, and I always say this is about the point in time when the average family practice physician starts to lose interest in the patient. Uh, seven to eight hours uh, after one dies, you start to stiffen up. And that's called rigor mortis. There's other pathological signs, liver mortis, things like this. But rigor mortis is well recognized, and that's why, you know, in the crime movies, you know, they, they call a dead body a stiff. Uh, people stiffen up, and what most folks don't realize is they stiffen up in a predictable sequence of small muscles versus large muscles, and that the, the rigor mortis will pass off in a, a similar fashion. So what that means is that a, uh, a well-educated forensic pathologist can be very precise by using liver temperature, can be used the, the appearance and disappearance of rigor uh, in estimating how long an individual has been dead, as long as they haven't been dead too long, a couple of days maybe. Other than that, they lose those landmarks, and there's nothing that worries a surgeon more than boring into a previous surgical incision with all the landmarks gone. So uh, this, is, this is where the, uh, the, the whole field starts to develop. So in order to uh, appreciate uh, you know, this, this sort of sequence, uh, decomposition of the force, it's, it's called taphomony, and uh, it, it's, a, it's a field of study. Uh, that if you know you're interested in these sorts of macabre things, that it's it's a very fascinating field. But <laughs> there are three basic phases, and I mention those because it helps explain why the flies that are part of my scientific background, why they do what they do. The first is autolysis. Now, I imagine that most of you remember, and I have no idea whether the the figures remain correct or not. But when you were much younger. Uh, and, and in grade school, uh, 
people said, you know, the cells of your body change all the time. As a matter of fact, uh, every seven years, you're fundamentally a brand new person. Remember that? When they told you that? I think it's probably right, but I have no idea whether seven years has any meaning to it or not. What I can tell you is that a living body, human body, warm-blooded mammal, etc., spends most of its metabolic energy replenishing the cells. And when they do that, old cells die off, and they have to be gotten rid of, and that's called the process of autolysis. And it happens all the time. Where uh, the thing to remember is that as living creatures right now, we are about this far from autolysis. So, uh, you know, uh, when, uh, when people uh, say, you know, uh, flies were coming around my nose and say, whew, not, not too good, uh, you know, you're about this far from being dead. Well, we're, biologically, we're, we're all on the cusp of autolysis. So, you know, uh, non-bacterial, fermentative uh, sort of degradation, release of gases, et cetera, uh, this, is, this is not news to anybody who's been involved in biological science. Putrefaction is when the body starts to uh, dissolve uh, and, uh, uh, and, and just go to pot. Uh, microorganisms that are harbored in the, in the GI tract, uh, you know, dead bodies that have kind of a greenish cast around the abdomen after they've been dead uh, a couple of days. And then the third phase would be necrophagus, or arthropods that feed on dead tissue. And those arthropods are a valuable ecological commodity because they are doing their ecological job to break down what is now uh, a dead organism and needs that, the, the, the stuff of which that organism is made needs to be returned into the ecological cycle. So <coughs> they appear after autolysis and putrefaction and pretty much after the, uh, uh, in most cases, the forensic pathologist has lost his or her landmarks and obviously, they're dependent upon the situation of the corpse. Uh, when I say that, uh, you know, is, is the corpse uh, out on the quad here at the university, out by the columns, lying on the grass, exposed to the elements? Or is it in this room over here? Uh, would that make a difference? Uh, of course it would. Uh, the insects have to get to the corpse uh, the season of the year. And so, fundamentally, when, when I, I, I talk to, to groups of law enforcement or uh, uh, down at, uh, uh, at Fort Leonard Wood, uh, the Criminal Investigation Division, they, they have uh, you know, all of the agents for the, the U.S. Army uh, and NCIS who are trained down there. And so you say, okay, uh, uh, forensic entomology uh, is useful as long as three factors are met. Number one, it has to be the season of the year when insects are active. We're getting toward the tail end. 60 degrees out there today, could you get insect activity? Absolutely. Uh, but if it was earlier this week, when it was down in the 20s, the answer would be no. Insects are not going to be active uh, as adults at that time of the year. So you have to have the season of the year when insects are active. Number two, you have to have access to the corpse, to the body. In other words, is the body outside? Is the body inside? Is the body in the trunk of a car? Is the body buried? What has happened? And then finally, number three, it has to be during daylight hours. The insects that I want to talk about are not active after dark. And that's just, that's just the, biologically the way that is. How do the insects, these flies, find the dead bodies? They can smell. They, the antennae of the flies have extremely sensitive olfactory sensilli, and they're able to respond to a couple molecules of smell. Uh, uh, you know, when, when you study flight patterns of insects, they weave back and forth, they can fly up, and they can, uh, insects can smell out pretty much anything that they are designed to smell out. These flies find dead bodies very quickly, very effectively, and they do it by their olfactory clues. So go back to Sung Tzu. It says, during summer, well, so number one, he recognized, you know, where was he working? Right around Beijing, China, which is about the same uh, 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 latitude as St. Louis, Missouri. It has, 
nothing but a barbed wire fence between it and the Gobi Desert, so there's more dust, but basically it's not much different than the climate around here. He says, when three days have passed, well, nothing magic about three days, but several days after death, it says a foul liquid will issue from the mouth and nose and maggots will appear. Well, it wasn't until centuries later that science recognized that maggots are, are immature flies, that they didn't just appear, that they're the progeny of flies either deposited as larvae or deposited as eggs in the eggs hatch. But it appeared to Song Tzu as the fly, they, these, these maggots just appear. <laughs> so when you get a situation like this where uh, there is a decedent and you can see that there is liquid that is issuing from the nostrils to ears and the mouth, you wonder why that is. Number one, dead people don't bleed. When your heart quits beating, you stop bleeding. Now blood can trickle out through gravity, but by and large, a, a, a dead person without major rents in the body is nothing but a, a, a sack, and it's a sack filled with liquid. And if you just think back a couple of slides to the phenomenon of autolysis, when that really kicks in and there's generation of gases, then the body starts to bloat. And when that happens, you've all seen it along the side of the road, a dead raccoon or whatever, with the legs sticking up. Sometimes it'll happen with a dead cow. <coughs> when you get this sort of bloating, then there's hydrostatic pressure, and turns out the fluid has got to go somewhere, and it comes out the orifices of the body. And so this decomposed body fluid issuing from the mouth, the eyes, the nose, is a highly attractive place for the female necrophagous flies, whose biological job it is to find a suitable spot where their progeny can survive. That's what, the, that's what they're designed to do. And they'll lay eggs around the eyes and the nostrils and the other orifices of the body. So uh, Sun Tzu says, during the hot months, okay, during the right season of the year, when maggots have not yet appeared at the nine orifices, and I always point out, I'd never counted them up before I read this, uh, and uh, Sun Tzu was right so many centuries ago, nine orifices, but they have appeared at the temple hairline, rib cage, or whatever, then these parts have been injured. And that's, that's forensically useful information. A uh, good example would be a decedent found with maggots crawling on the palms of the hand. Now, the palms of your hand are leathery. There's no natural orifice there. So under hydrostatic pressure, no liquid is going to squirt out of the palms of your hand. But when you see maggots in there, then the next thing you can tell the forensic pathologist is when you're doing the autopsy, look, look on the bones for knife cuts because somebody has probably tried to fend off a, something sharp and it's gotten cut and uh, then the maggots have free reign now that the skin has been cut open uh, to, uh, uh, to infest there. Uh, so that goes back to the mid-1200s. <laughs> Dead bodies can be found in all sorts of environments. Open air, they can be buried, they can be in the water. I can tell you water, bodies in the water are really difficult to deal with from the standpoint of forensic entomology. There are some entomologists who are fundamentally aquatic entomologists and have made some progress in looking at colonization by, uh, by uh, Trichoptera and, and uh, other aquatic insects, but it's not as straightforward as what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, geographic area, town or country, there is some progress that has been made. One of the reasons why this was a, uh, uh, an interesting question is back in the 1930s, uh, the uh, FBI and the Metropolitan Police in Washington, D.C. asked entomologists at the U.S. National Museum uh, whether they could tell whether a body by the insects on it had been killed downtown in Washington and taken out in the country and dumped, or whether they had been killed out in the country. And the answer was, yeah, there are some inferences that can be drawn by what species are found. Uh, the science has not gone very much further than that over the years, but I can tell you that occasionally when you find bodies in the upper Midwest with species indigenous to Florida, you can make an assumption that that body has probably been moved, and, and that has been the case in a number of, of situations. Local climate, season of the year, amount of uh, uh, mutilation of the body. This is the abdomen of a guy uh, who
who got into image of depressing sameness in most of the homicides around here, uh, an altercation involving illicit drugs. This was in the summertime, just north of Columbia. This guy uh, was killed by a shotgun blast and was found, and you can see in the, in, in the gut here, there's a lot of putrefaction. There are maggots all through the, 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 the gut. Uh, and so if you say to yourself, gosh, I wonder how long that guy has been dead. Uh, you say, that's a good question. You look at his, uh, at, at his skull, and, and there's his skull, and it's not fair because I know what the answer is. You say, how long has that guy been dead? In, in the summertime in Columbia, Missouri. Answer, 12 days. So things happen more rapidly than most people would want to believe. Uh, after you're dead, you, you tend to return to the, the essential elements of what you were uh, pretty rapidly. So, the way that this whole field becomes interesting is to talk about some cases. And over the years, I've, I've selected out some cases that I think prove certain sorts of points about what you can and can't do with this, this field of forensic science. And so the first one uh, is, is one that, uh, that I was involved with uh, uh, many years ago. I don't know whether any of you have ever watched the TV show called Forensic Files. Anybody ever watch that? Okay. Uh, Forensic Files is, is an interesting show, and I don't often watch it. But one day, I, for whatever reason, I, I happened to be someplace, and there was a television. I turned it on, Forensic Files, and it had this episode. It was called Scout's Honor, and so I thought, I'll, I'll watch that, and I, I watched it, and then I had a, an eerie feeling as it went on. And finally, I said, you know, this is kind of strange, because I did that case. <laughs> and, and so this is uh, uh, one that I think uh, proves an important point. Blowfly eggs uh, as the, the only stage present. Uh, the style of the case is Pennsylvania v. Ruby. It was a homicide, and the facts of the case as they were revealed to me. And I, I should tell you that as an expert witness in cases like this, you have to be careful not to know more or try to infer more than your science needs. The, the, the job of the, the, the expert scientist is to tell the trier of fact, in a, in, a, in a criminal case, that would be a jury, to try to tell those 12 people, to the best of your scientific knowledge, what the evidence means. And if you get sidetracked by saying there was a cadaver dog that alerted or whatever that has nothing to do with the science, then you're, uh, you're, you're getting off track. So what I knew about this case was uh, there was a guy who went fishing one afternoon, central Pennsylvania, and that was probably the first mistake of his day. He went fishing. Then he was going down the river, and I guess he wasn't having much luck because he looked up on the bank of the river and he saw a cardboard box, and he saw what he thought looked like a pig. And he said, I just thought I'd go up there and see whether that pig was in kind of good shape or not. And so he walked up, and sure enough, there was a cardboard box. There was a black plastic trash bag that had come open, and a, a, a pig-like looking thing slid out of the trash bag and was lying there. And it turned out it was the torso of a woman. And there was no head, no arms, no legs. Uh, why I should remember that her name was Edna Posey, I don't know. But uh, nonetheless, this was what remained of Edna. And it was noted between 2 and 3 in the afternoon on 27 May 1984. That's when the guy walked up and said, holy smokes, I think this is, this is a dead person, not a pig. So... Uh, Apparently what had happened is that there was a road and, and a railing at the top of the, of the riverbank, and apparently someone had stopped a vehicle. I don't know, maybe they carried the box. I honestly don't know. But they had tossed the box over the embankment. It had rolled down the hill, hit a tree, slid off, opened the plastic bag. It was apparently not tied, so the, the torso slid out. That, that is apparently what had happened. So it was exposed there. 
autopsy by a qualified medical examiner was done at 9 o'clock that evening. That was part of the medical record. And the, the, uh, uh, the forensic pathologist made a specific observation of blowfly eggs on the places where the head had been cut off, the arms and legs had been cut off. So you then say to yourself, you know, can they really tell whether they're eggs or not? Answer, yes, they can. Uh, it, it's, it's not sophisticated observation. Blowfly eggs look like little grains of, of sand, and they come in clumps. And, you know, you see one, you've seen them all. You may not know what the species is, you may not know how old they are, but you can tell whether they're eggs or not. So that's what, uh, that went into the, the medical record. Now, FBI got involved, and uh, sometime between 30 May and 31 July is when they obtained the evidence. That's not particularly useful. Uh, I, I can tell you the FBI, uh, you may have your own questions about that uh, uh, law enforcement agency. I can tell you that there are many very highly qualified FBI agents that do a super job. They do a much better job in forensic entomology now than they did back in 1984. Victim was last seen about 9 o'clock at night on the 25th of May or maybe early afternoon of the 26th May. Time of last scene can be useful, but does it, does it count for much? It's eyewitness testimony, right? So do you always believe eyewitness testimony? Huh? No, not necessarily. I mean, sometimes you say, I saw it with my own eyes. But you've all been involved in situations, and it's, it's done routinely in classrooms, uh, when uh, they'll, they'll put on some sort of altercation and then ask the class, recount what you saw. And people see it differently. So time of last scene can be useful, uh, but you have to take it with a, uh, uh, a, a grain of sand, as it were. So trial court, 1984. Ruby uh, was uh, found guilty, got a life sentence. Uh, in that, he was probably fortunate. Uh, at that point, insect uh, evidence had not been evaluated, and it was, certainly was not introduced at trial. Is that a problem? How come? Well, because, because it's, it's evidence that, that may have some probative value to, to deciding whether, whether Ruby did it or not. And uh, if it is not introduced at trial, then it has no impact on the trier of fact. And from the standpoint of judicial economy, you can say, oh, my golly, now what's going to happen? What's going to happen? What happened is Ruby was in, he was in the joint. And he said, hey, I had ineffective assistance of counsel. There was this insect evidence and they should have introduced it. Didn't introduce it, so I want a new trial. That's what happens. Trials are not cheap to put on. But this is what happened. He got a new counsel. His new counsel, new lawyer, was much sharper than, uh, than the individual that had represented him previously. And at that point, the insect evidence had been in storage for nine years. It was uh, preserved in formalin, which had since dried up, but the formalin had done its job. It had preserved the material. I rehydrated that stuff. And uh, it turned out, the fully embryonated blowfly eggs, there were some first and second instar larvae that were in this vial that was rehydrated, and we were able to look at that uh, evidence. Two species were involved, Formia regina. These, these Latin names are of interest only to uh, uh, forensic entomologists and entomology graduate students. Other than that, they're, they're, we can call it the black blowfly and the blue blowfly. Uh, but you have to know what the species are, or at least the genus, uh, in order to make any sense out of it. And that's why the entomologist is, is a, a valuable witness. Uh, so we knew what the species were, and then the next question was, okay, how does this biology work? Well, arthropods are cold-blooded, and they develop and they function as, a, uh, uh, a, a, as an aspect of temperature. Uh, you know, a typical uh, uh, S-shaped biological curve, uh, the top of which it becomes so hot that everything dies, at the bottom of which it becomes so cold that everything freezes solid. 
in the middle, the development of these creatures approximates a straight line. And that's where you see most of the biological activity. So trivially, the warmer it is, the faster things happen. So in order to make any sense out of it, you have to know what the temperature was at the time that the action took place. There are no time machines that I'm aware of. How do you get that? Well, uh, I always tell the students, if you find a body out on the quad here at the university, where's your closest temperature recording station? Answer, Sanborn Field. It's, it's right over there, 24-7. They take the temperature, take relative humidity, take all the rest of it. Uh, from the standpoint of the United States at large, every major airport records temperature and weather data on a routine basis. So, went to the closest airport and, uh, and found out what, the, uh, uh, what the, the prevailing temperatures were nine years past. And now, you can get that information online on almost any weather reporting station, any airport. If you want to get it for any time in the past, you can do that. Uh, it also raises the question, as a, a defense attorney, you would say, okay, so uh, what, can, what can you infer from temperatures that are at some distance? Everybody's seen a situation where an uh, airport might be down in a valley and the dead body's up on the top of a mountain, 4,000 feet higher. Would there be a difference in temperature? Probably so. Uh, if, if there are significant mountain ranges or some sort of of uh, geographic situation that would allow you not to rely totally on those temperatures, then you're obligated to acknowledge those. In this situation, there wasn't much distance and there, and there wasn't much of a difference that I could tell. So we got those weather records. And what I concluded from that was the temperatures that were probably prevailing at that scene were sufficient so that the eggs of these blowflies would have hatched within 24 hours. Most, most blowfly eggs hatch within 16 to 24 hours. Uh, so 24 hours is at the end of that. You, so in my opinion, you'd say 24 hours at these prevailing temperatures, these eggs would have hatched. Uh, we know from multitudes of studies uh, when the blowflies deposit their eggs, generally during solar mid-afternoon, uh, 2, 3 o'clock in the afternoon, uh, Thesis during darkness, unless you've got some really bright artificial light, that was not the case at this river body scene. So the straightforward conclusion was if the body had been where it was found during the afternoon of May 26, about 30 hours would have elapsed prior to autopsy, and that would have been enough for these eggs to have hatched. So the question came up, can an experienced medical examiner tell the difference between unhatched and hatched blowfly eggs? Answer, absolutely. Uh, as I said earlier, the, the uh, unhatched eggs appear through the microscope or to just casual observation as little grains of sand. Once the eggs hatch, they melt down into a glistening mass of, of wiggling stuff. Uh, the first instar maggots are very small, but they, they wiggle around, and you can see the, the movement. So you don't have to be a, a, a doctoral-level entomologist to make that distinction. A, a, a medical examiner certainly can do that. So in this case, the only timely observation was that the eggs were unhatched. So my conclusion was that the body was probably deposited during the hours of darkness between 26 and 27 May. Uh, and this was really the only reliable aspect of the, the entomology evidence in this particular case. Uh, I said that there were some... Uh, there were some uh, 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 embryonated blowfly eggs. There were first and second instar larvae. Uh, that was all preserved after the fact. Couldn't really be evaluated, so I couldn't calculate what's called a PMI or post-mortem interval. All I could calculate was a time of exposure. When this human torso had been exposed to the elements that allowed the insects to come in and deposit their eggs on it, that period of exposure. I had no idea how long she might have been dead. But the period of exposure was what uh, we could testify to. And uh, I don't know what his alibi was, but uh, Mr. Ruby had a valid alibi for the period of 26, 27 May. Now, trivially, uh, if you're looking for an alibi, what's your best alibi? Being in jail. Absolutely. How come? Well, it's because you're using state's evidence against them. 
They say, we think you did it on the 26th, 27th of May. And you say, hey, how could I have done that? He says, look at your own jail records. I was in jail. Now, I don't know what Ruby's alibi was, but it was enough to convince the jury that he didn't do it. So he was exonerated. And uh, he left the state of Pennsylvania, uh, moved away, and has never been heard from since. Uh, another case, uh, Missouri v. Middleton. This is one, if you read the newspapers, you, you, you may recognize this. Uh, Harrison County, Missouri, and there was a woman who got up one morning, took her dog for a walk. She lived up in North Missouri on a gravel road, and she walked out with her dog, and then she came back and called the sheriff's department, and she said, there's a dead guy out at the end of my road, and I want you to come get him. And so the sheriff, the sheriff, they sent the deputies out there, and they said, sure enough, there's a dead guy out here, and found him about 10 o'clock in the morning on 26 June 1995. Uh, and this is one of those situations where he was lying at the side of the road, uh, completely exposed, uh, what was left of his face staring up at the, at the sky. There was no barrier in between him and the, the rest of the zoological universe. Uh, and, and so it's a, it's a good case to talk about because there's no confounding factor. Uh, the cor as I said, the course was completely exposed. There he was. Uh, last seen about 11 in the morning on 23 June 1995. Uh, his name was Alfred Penninger, and he came from uh, Lamoni, Iowa. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, Alfred had become involved in the meth trade. And I can tell you that there's a lot of senseless violence that occurs in the state of Missouri and other states in the, in the U.S. centered around methamphetamine. Uh, it, it's a bad material. People go berserk. They do things that they probably wish that they hadn't. Uh, entomological evidence was collected at autopsy, uh, which was uh, recorded to be at 2 o'clock in the afternoon on 26 June 1995. Now, how did I know that? I can tell you that's because Sergeant Bodenhamer of the Missouri Highway Patrol brought that sack, an evidence sack, which is nothing more than the kind of paper bag that you'd get at High V to put your groceries in, stapled up, had the stuff inside of it, and written on the side of it was the information about uh, you know, where the evidence had come from, where the autopsy had been done, all the rest. There was uh, two samples. One was preserved in fluid, which was like alcohol. Uh, which is what I would have recommended. And there was one they had tried to keep alive, because I always say the crime scene investigators is really hard, uh, but I can, I can be much more comfortable with identifying adult flies than the maggots. When you work with the maggots, it takes, uh, uh, is, is more tedious, and there's always more of a question in my mind. But nonetheless, in this case, the, uh, the, the samples they tried to keep alive had decomposed. So, uh, I, I had the preserved specimens. There were literally thousands of them. Uh, the so-called secondary screw worm, Cochleomaya, and Formia origina, the black blowfly that we saw in the previous case. These were both third instars, or, or third stage maggots. Then these blowflies, when they hatch from the egg, they hatch into a first stage little tiny maggot that feeds and then molts into a second stage maggot, and then that feeds and molts into a third stage maggot which eventually will become a prepupa that becomes enclosed in a sclerotized puparium, and then eventually the adult fly comes out. That's, that's the life cycle, the whole metabolist life cycle of these flies. So that's, that's what the evidence was. Then we needed to get the retrospective temperatures, and I got those from the North Missouri Center, which is about 10 miles away, the rolling hills of North Missouri, pretty flat, pretty boring as, as uh, uh, things go, uh, and I, so I got those temperatures, and they were recorded as daily maximum and minimum temperatures. Uh, and we say most mature specimens used for analysis. Well, that's just a, a forensic entomology point of trivia. Uh, if you have a, 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 a dead individual today, flies can come in and, and deposit eggs today, and they will then start to mature. You also can have flies that will come in and lay eggs tomorrow, and they will start to mature. As long as the dead person is amenable to having fly eggs laid on it, then you'll have a variety of ages. If you're looking to figure out how long this individual has been dead, you use the oldest specimens. 
and trivially, in entomology, typically oldest means biggest. So most mature, biggest specimens, that's what we use. We know from measurements in the laboratory and the field about the biology of these very, very common slow fly species. Uh, requires about maybe 800 accumulated degree hours to enter the third end star. This is the same sort of temperature analysis that campus facilities would do on this building to figure out when it's time to turn the heat on or turn the air conditioning on. It's, it, it's using accumulated degree days or degree hours. It's, it's not that sophisticated. None of this analysis is that sophisticated. It's all applied biology. That's, that's all it amounts to. So uh, the way I looked at this case was there were insufficient accumulated degree hours to support the theory that the development began on June 24th. And I knew that the secondary screw worm typically delays coming into a dead body for some period of time. Typical question that has been answered over and over and over again, and that is, you got a dead body, how quick do the flies get there? Answer, within minutes. How do you know? Well, we don't need to do the experiment anymore. Uh, typically what is done is uh, under a situation where you have a surrogate for a human. Very difficult to find human volunteers for this kind of research. But a, a, a surrogate, such as a pig. So you look at your watch, take a pistol, pow, shoot the pig in the back of the head, and then step back and say, I wonder when the flies will get here. Oh, look, they're already here. They come within minutes. As long as it's season of the year, there is no barrier to the flies, and it's during daylight hours. So that's been done over and over again. And over the years, research has measured the propensity of various species to appear. Secondary screw worm typically delays somewhat. So I factored that in, and I concluded that overposition probably occurred late on June 23rd. And uh, when I looked at Formia regina, the other species that we had found, that substantiated that particular theory. So uh, in my opinion, death probably occurred after the time of last seen and prior to sundown on 23 June. And uh, that resulted in and amongst other things uh, that were introduced at trial as a, uh, a guilty verdict. Uh, now, I said earlier that as, as an expert witness, you really don't, you shouldn't be privy to information that might bias your scientific evaluation. So I didn't know until after I was done testifying, and I, you know, I, you look up at the judge and you say, uh, uh, Your Honor, may I, may I be excused? And the judge says, Yes. And then you say, do you, do you mind if I sit in the back of the courtroom? No, you're done. You can sit anywhere you want. You can uh, do what you want to do. I sat in the back of the courtroom. Turned out that, that uh, the defendant, uh, John Middleton, had been involved in the meth trade. Uh, he was known to be unpredictable. Talked about, I'm going to take out the snitches. You snitch on me and you're dead, things like that. Uh, he made a mistake, had his girlfriend in the truck when he shot Mr. Pinnegar. And she brooded about that for several days and then finally turned state's evidence. And... Uh, then he had given the shotgun, and of course there are no ballistics on, on shotgun pellets, but he had given the shotgun to a friend and said, get rid of this. The friend threw it in a lake, and then eventually told the sheriff's department, I bet you'd like to know where that gun is. And they said, well, why don't you show us? So during the entire trial, the gun sat leaning up against the lectern there in the courtroom, which I thought was a, a, an interesting piece of street theater. Uh, but that's, believe it, that's what most trials are, are street theater. Uh, and uh, so the defense strategy was pretty thin, uh, no evidence, uh, defendant didn't take the stand, uh, and he was sentenced to death. So that's, that's the way that goes. And so uh, 19 years later, uh, I was, was sitting in my office over in Jesse Holm, telephone rang, and it was a telephone call from New York City. And I thought, what in the hell did somebody from New York City be calling me for? It turned out it was a clemency attorney. And they uh, had uh, taken on the case because 19 years after the imposition of the death sentence, the state of Missouri was getting ready to execute Mr. Middleton. And so it went to a, a final clemency hearing. And so the, the guy said, 
Let me ask you a question. Do you remember the Middleton case? And I said, like it was yesterday. And he said, so uh, you said the autopsy was done on 26 June. Where did you get that information? I said, that's easy. Sergeant Bodenhammer of the Missouri Highway Patrol wrote it on the evidence bag, and that's what he told me. Now, was I entitled to rely on that? Of course. You know, that's what I was told. The truth teller there would have been uh, during, during the, the, the trial if the defense attorney had said something, he'd questioned that and said, where did you get that information? I would have said, Sergeant Bodenhammer told me. Nobody ever asked me that question, and I had no reason to question that at all. But he, this guy in New York said, did you ever see the autopsy report? Nope, they never showed that to me. He said, would you like to see the autopsy report? I said, not particularly. He said, would it, would it change your mind if the autopsy report said that the autopsy was done 24 hours later than 26 June? And I said, well, that would, be, that would be interesting. And he said, if that was the case, would that change your analysis of the situation? And I said, well, I said, I'd be happy to reanalyze the whole thing, but I said, just speaking off the cuff, I said, it'd probably change it by about 24 hours. And he said, well, uh, I'll send you the report. He did. He was right. And so I did a reanalysis of the case, and I filed an affidavit that said that the whole analysis had to be brought forward about 24 hours. And uh, during that period of time, uh, Middleton had an alibi. Guess what it was? He was in jail. He was in jail. And uh, so I thought, well, that, well, our uh, Attorney General of Missouri said that that reanalysis uh, had no merit, and so they executed the guy anyway. So, you know, said, okay, uh, let's, let's, let's give uh, a certain amount of credit. Uh, Middleton had two additional death sentences against him. And so whether he did this one or not, the honest thing for the attorney general to have done, I won't even tell you what his name is, but he's still around, to have done is say, okay, we don't think he did this one, but he did the other two, so you get the green needle anyway. Uh, but the lesson to be learned, try to stay off death row in Missouri if you possibly can. Okay, another case that uh, I, I think can show you where this sort of science can run amok would be People v. McWhorter. It's a, uh, it's a case that occurred in Oilville, California, and uh, as audiences age, I, I find the younger audience has had, they don't connect on Oilville or uh, Bakersfield, California. What's, what's anything that is notable about Bakersfield, California? Not anymore, but used to be. It's the home of Buck Owens and the Buckaroos, okay? The California country, that was Bakersfield. But anyhow, Oilville is a little, a little suburb of Bakersfield up in the, the entrance to the San Joaquin, not San Joaquin, San Joaquin Valley. Uh, and what happened was, in this case, there were two decedents found in a closed-up house on 18 December. And, and Bakersfield, California, is still hot at that time of the year. They were last seen on 11 September. The police reported the corpses, and I thought this was charming, heavily maggotized. I, I, I've used that since then. I thought it, it's a, that, that has a certain charm to it. Uh, there were flies all over the place. Uh, the screens that were in place, all the doors were shut. Here's a picture of the house. You can see when I took this picture, it was still for sale. Uh, it didn't sell very readily. What had happened was there was a woman who was washing her car that was right about where this, this isn't her car, but the car was parked right about there. And she was out there washing the car, and she, something, oh, something smells bad. I don't know what it is. I haven't seen the neighbors in a while. She called her husband, and she said, I think something's wrong, uh, and see if you can look in the window. He looked and couldn't get the window up. He said, bring me a big knife. He, he pried the window up and pulled the screens and looked in and said, oh, my God, I call the police. Police kicked in the door and said, the people in there are heavily magnetized. So that's, uh, that's what happened. Uh, this is a little boy. Joey was his name. Joey, somebody sat on him until they smothered him to death. And you can see that he's uh, decomposed and, and kind of soaked into the bed there. Mom is down on the floor. And uh, from the standpoint of entomology, 
It's interesting because some of the flies that we found associated with this case had crawled around. Uh, it, entomologically, it was not a difficult case for the uh, you know, uh, uh, blood spatter on the walls, whether or not that is tracks from uh, flies tracking in the blood and getting up on the walls. That was a question that was asked. Uh, there are fly pupae along the walls there. But the essence of the case was that there was no entomological evidence obtained at the scene or at autopsy. What they did at autopsy was to, mom was brought in, uh, and she was uh, brought in in uh, uh, an ambulance and brought into the autopsy room, and they took a big pair of scissors, and they, they cut her T-shirt off. And they took the T-shirt off, and they dropped it into an evidence bag, which is like a bag you get from Schnucks, the grocery store. It's a, it's a brown paper sack. Dropped it in there, stapled it up, and, and that, was, that was it. From the standpoint of good entomological science, would that be a good way to collect entomology specimens? No, it would not be. Uh, as a matter of fact, you probably wouldn't be able to defend your thesis if that was the procedure that you had employed. Nonetheless, that's what we were, what we were, were left with. So uh, it was in dry storage for a number of years. And then it was brought out, <coughs> and it was evaluated for the defense uh, by a guy who's a forensic entomologist in Southern California. I know him real well, and he's very good. And uh, secondary screw worm, Chrysomia rufifaces, which is an invading uh, a blowfly species in the United States, and some flesh fly species. That's what the insects were. Uh, and the defense then, uh, used that information, and here's the defense that they presented. That the temperatures at the Bakersfield airport equaled the temperatures inside the house. Now, does that make good sense? How come? Because during the summertime, all you see on the evening news is don't leave your dog or kid in the car because when the car is closed up and it's summertime, things get really a lot hotter in the car than they are outside of the car. So almost everybody knows that. So, but they asserted that the temperatures were equal. And what would, what would be the way to, uh, to, to actually resolve that particular dispute? The way to do it would be to go back at about the same time of the year, close up the house, run a thermometer recording inside the house, co-locate another thermometer at the Bakersfield airport, and see whether there's a repeatable difference between the two locations. If so, you could always correct for that difference, but this was not done. Then their theory was that the flies accessed the bodies and oviposited within an hour after death. Does that make good sense? Well, I, I told you earlier, the reason I point out this case, the Middleton case, is because Mr. Pinnaker was dead out at the end of a gravel road with nothing between him and the universe. But if you have bodies inside of a closed up house, there was a swamp cooler that was not turned on, all the doors were shut, all the curtains were down, all the screens were shut, windows were down, it would be like having a body in this room off here. Will the flies find that body? Answer, in the summertime, eventually they will. But will they do it within an hour? I don't think so. I don't know. You know, all I could say is that the people that were the decedents in this case probably did not have any fly maggots on them. Now, there is a phenomenon known as myiasis where living people can get fly maggots on them, but it's, it's very unlikely that this happened. Uh, uh, so no fly maggots in all likelihood when they were alive, and when the police kicked in the door, they were heavily maggotized. So sometime in between those two ends of the spectrum is when the flies got there. Within an hour, I think that's a stretch. Then, <laughs> good forensic entomology demands that when the fly evidence is preserved, whether it's at autopsy or at the scene, a note is made of that. Uh, whether the, uh, uh, the medical examiner drops the maggots into embalming fluid or into formalin. Formalin is not used much anymore because people are concerned about any health risks. Rubbing alcohol. I always tell the detectives it's a waste of good whiskey, but temporarily you can preserve these things in, in, in uh, whiskey. Uh, not for long, it's only about 40%, but you can, you can do it for a short period of time. That kills the maggots and preserves it at a known period of time. So they were confronted with, how are we going to get by that? I know how we can do it. Took mom's 
T-shirt out of the evidence bag and said, look, you can see maggots on here, and they look like they're pretty flat. And therefore, we think what happened was when mom was taken out of the apartment and put into the ambulance, the maggots were squished and preserved at that time. Well, uh, that's, that's ingenious, but it's highly unlikely because a, a maggot is mainly liquid, and any maggot, when it dies and desiccates, is flat. And so after years in an evidence bag, all these maggots are going to be flat. Uh, and so their theory was that the development time from the third instar to the egg was the representative of the postmortem interval. Why did they want to do that? Because they had an alibi for that particular time. So just had to point out to the jury that larvae crushed uh, uh, at, at the time. That, that, in my opinion, is a real stretch. Flies accessing the decedents within an hour after death uh, is a stretch. And airport temperatures being the same at the house is pretty much preposterous. Uh, so the conclusion the defense had, about four days, that re represented the PMI, uh, and the defendant had an alibi. But we went in and argued that there was really no concordance, that this didn't make good biological sense. There was no proof that the maggots had been crushed. And so the, uh, the, the way the jury read that was garbage in, garbage out. And so it was a guilty verdict on both counts in this particular case. And it was probably justified by information that came up later. Child was not at school after the 11th of September because they keep records at school, you know. Mom's medicine, she was kind of a hypochondriac and she had one of these things, my pills for the week, okay. Pills were not taken after the 11th. Neither were seen after the 11th. Uh, there were messages on the telephone recorder of uh, one of Joey's little friends calling to find out why he wasn't coming out to, to play after school. Uh, so they think they have a motive for uh, money. At any rate, uh, two counts of, uh, of guilty. I'm going to go through this last one very rapidly because it's an interesting case because it brings up uh, how you can get into areas that are unknown. Here's a female decedent in uh, Colorado Springs. If you fly into Colorado Springs, you can see the escarpment out the right-hand side of the aircraft. But she was last seen around July 11, uh, 2007, uh, in the evening. Uh, she was eventually found buried under a rock, and insect evidence was preserved uh, at a known time, a known uh, hour. Uh, I knew what the species were, uh, reared the, uh, uh, the adult secondary screwworm flies out, uh, used uh, temperatures from the Colorado Springs Airport because it is so close to where this all happened. I knew what the temperature profile of that secondary screwworm fly was, what the delay ought to be. Uh, and here's the confounding factor. Burial would have caused an unknown delay in overposition. Here, here is a general view. Uh, you can see the kind of orange and sort of the, the, the right center of the photograph. That's where the crime scene investigators finally found under this rock they looked under there, and they thought somebody's hand is sticking out of the ground. It wasn't a hand, it was a foot. But the, uh, uh, whoever buried this woman uh, had driven to the top of the escarpment, taken her out of the trunk of a car, thrown her over the escarpment, then gone down and dug out from under this rock, stuffed her down in there, and then buried her, but neglected to bury the very end of her foot. And you can see as they excavated all this, down in the ground there are third stage maggots. I mean, they're just all over the place. So if you would say that burial uh, uh, prohibits infestation by insect uh, 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 invaders, you would be wrong. The question is, how long did it take them to get down in there and find that body? And to this day, I don't know. You can see all the evidence that is there. Uh, the, the, there's the top of the woman's head. Her, all her hair came off, and you can see all the maggots that are on the top of her head. Uh, extrinsic evidence that I wasn't privy to when I came up with this uh, analysis. Uh, there was blood in the defendant's car, in the trunk. Remember I said somebody drove her up to the top of the escarpment and pitched her out. Well, they did the DNA on the blood. It was her blood. And so they said to this guy, so how did her blood get in the trunk of her car? And he said, I know what must have happened. She OD'd. It was really bad. And I was scared. And so I took her body and put it in the trunk of the car. 
And then I decided I need to get rid of it, so I drove it up, pitched it over the cliff, and I went down and buried it. Does that make good sense? Not really. But at any rate, uh, the thing that I found refreshing was that there was no cross-examination. Only time I've ever been an expert witness in a trial, and they have not given me a vigorous cross-examination. Because I think they knew that it was, uh, it, it was, it was pretty much hopeless. So this guy was convicted of that crime, and, and that's the last I know about this particular case. A lot of research has been done in forensic entomology. As I said earlier, it's difficult to get graduate students to volunteer to be the subjects. So a lot of it has been done on animal parts, on large animals, on meat baits such as liver, chunks of meat, things like this that would approximate uh, small animals. A lot of pioneering research has been done on small animals. Uh, the only problem with that is that small animals are a much more ephemeral substrate than our larger animals. So you can only go so far with a decomposing mouse or a decomposing rat or a decomposing chicken uh, compared to a decomposing human being. Uh, but Bill Bass, when he started with the, the body farm in, in Tennessee many years ago, the reason he did this was because he is... Uh, uh, and, and he's still with us, although he's retired now, just like I am, uh, he decided that the, the uh, skeletons used to instruct classes in forensic anthropology were not representative of the population in the United States today. How come? Because almost all those skeletons were black males between the ages of 18 and 22 years. And, and, and that's just not representative of our population. So he said, I know what we need. We need new skeletons. How to get new skeletons? Well, I can tell you the most grisly way is to try to skin somebody out. Uh, it, uh, uh, it just doesn't work well. Uh, and he said, you know, the way nature does this, the way we do it for museum specimens is to let nature take its course, let the domestic beetles work it, get the bones clean and all the rest. Then we'll have a dandy, brand new skeleton that we can use for classroom instruction. Where to do this? Well, right outside the back of the University of Tennessee Medical Center, uh, a few acres out there, and uh, uh, Patricia Cornwall is, has um, um, called this the body farm, and that's pretty much what it's been known by. For many years, it was the only place in the United States where this sort of research could be done legally on dead human beings. Now there's one in Tennessee and one in California, but for many years, this, this was it, and uh, in order to encourage people to donate, uh, there was a tax credit. That's not a deduction. That's a tax credit of 1500 bucks that the, the dearly departed is not going to enjoy, but the family might. So uh, that's how a lot of this worked. There's a, a photograph of a number of years ago outside the back of the University of Tennessee. This is a sidewalk where uh, a lot of the employees would walk down, and it's curious because uh, once, once we started to use pigs in this facility, in addition to people, folks who were hospital employees, such as nurses, secretaries, and other folks, would walk down that sidewalk and they would say, there's something different in there. Well, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the, the, the null hypothesis that we were able to establish was that the insect uh, 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 decomposers uh, find no difference between a dead human being and a dead pig, even though the people said they thought they could detect a kind of a difference in smell. Just go figure. But nonetheless, keep the fraternities out. There is concertina wire on top. Bill Bass, uh, he's now turned this over to other people, but it's still in operation. And there have been all sorts of interesting things. You know, if you think that being embalmed is going to pr protect you, Think again, this is a decedent that was embalmed and they decided, uh, you know, they'd just see what would happen and that's, uh, that's what happened. You know, there's a guy, they, they were willing to use body parts also, and so this guy was going to lose his leg from advanced complications of diabetes and they said, uh, they came up and they said, you know, this is uh, full disclosure now, they said, you're going to take that leg off and would you be willing to donate that to the body farm? And he said, well, okay, as long as I get it back when you're done with it. And, uh, hey, not, not a problem. Uh, but
But the, the reason that we as entomologists were interested in this is because it gave us the opportunity to validate the use of pigs as a surrogate for human beings in research to be done in locations such as Columbia, Missouri, where use of dead people is legally forbidden. And so we had to validate this, and here's a, uh, all the pigs were killed the same way, not to, be, not to be mean to them, but they were shot in the back of the head, and then their throats were cut, and they were stuck with a knife, and it was a, kind of an ugly thing. But uh, here's a dead pig that has just been exposed, and there's a dead pig three days later in the body farm, completely covered with maggots. Uh, and so one of the things we were confronted with then was an objection from defense attorneys that said, well, you know, things happen really fast and any data from the body farm can't be reliable because it's such a decay-rich environment there. I said earlier this session that Missouri is a decay-rich environment. And as a matter of fact, uh, this, this happens just all the time. And here's a, a trail of larvae, that, uh, maggots that are migrating away from the dead pig. They'll crawl up trees and uh, it's, it's really an odd uh, situation. But the thing we learned about this was that it is uh, maggot power alone that will disarticulate a skeleton like that. Uh, because all these were protected by screening and the insect could get in, but coyotes and dogs and other things could not get in there. So all this is done strictly by the vigorous power of the maggots as they disarticulate these skeletons. Uh, here's a, a, a guy who uh, wound up in the body farm. His uh, family donated the body. They got the $1,500 tax credit. Uh, you can see that he, they worked on his head, but it didn't, uh, it didn't, didn't uh, work out well. Uh, what happened to him was that he fell off of a bar stool, if you can believe that. Fell off a bar stool and bumped his head, and now he's in the body farm. So all forensic entomologists learned a lesson from this, and the lesson is, don't sit on really tall bar stools. Sit on lower ones in case you fall off. Here he is going in, and of course there have some legal niceties before he's exposed, but this is as quickly as this could be done, and this is 32 days later. So Knoxville, Tennessee, 32 days, that's, uh, that's what you have. Uh, was this a good uh, use of this particular decedent? Yes, because a lot of information is obtained about the sequence and, and the validation of humans versus pigs exposed at the same time. This is a stillborn baby, uh, and this is really unfortunate, but the reason I put it in at the final slide is because this is the baby when it was exposed at the body farm, and this is five days later. So uh, from the standpoint of crime scene investigation, if you have a, a disappeared baby, you have to get with the program really fast. Otherwise, you're probably never going to find that, that infant. And so uh, that is, is the essence of medical criminal entomology. Uh, I found it, uh, uh, it has its moments, and uh, you know, if I had to do it over again, would, would, I, would I take the same path? Uh, I don't know, uh, but uh, it's been a good ride, and so I appreciate you all spending your, uh, inexplicably spending your Saturday morning uh, sitting here listening to such a macabre thing. But as I said, it does have its moments, so thank you. All right, if you have any questions, please raise your hand and I'll bring you a microphone. Uh, one question I have is, is the fly population around the University of Tennessee increased because of all those maggots look like they would make an awful lot of flies? It, you, you would think so, but as, as a matter of fact, as near as we can tell from all the measurements we've made, no. It really, the, the idea of increased decomposition activity because of the amount of decomposition in the body farm itself has not really caused a shift in the rapidity with which this occurs or the speed, you know, when it appears. So, yeah, it's a good question. And I tell you, that's, that we got the hammered from defense on that all the time. But the measurements and the, the, the way that we did this was uh, when this started to become an issue, we had to resolve it. And so what we did was to take we used, by that time, we'd validated using pigs as a surrogate. And so we took replicate dead pigs, we exposed them at the body farm, we then found another location at the U UT campus, we then found an off-campus location, and then fortunately I've got a good, a good childhood friend who lives on a farm up near Norris Lake, 
in Norris, Tennessee, about 20 miles north. And so I called him on the telephone. I said, hey, Roger, would you mind if we put some dead pigs out on the back end of your farm? And he said, what for? <laughs> I said, you wouldn't believe it if I told you. He said, go ahead and do what you want to do. So we did that, and we found no difference in decomposition between those locations. I have a question for you. The, um, I'm really struck by your last two slides. So you had the decomposition of the gentleman who had fallen off the bar stool. Right. And you have the decomposition of the baby. And I'm struck by the fact that the gentleman who fell off the bar stool, there are bones left. And with the baby, at least it, it doesn't look like there are any bones. And I'm wondering if that has to do with the status of skeletal structure in an infant. Well, I, I think that's a good, and I'm not sure that I can r raise your hand so I can see where, oh, way, way up there in the back, okay. Uh, I, that's a very good question, and, and, and I can't provide a definitive answer to that because we, we, we've never had enough replicate samples of newborn babies to do anything like this. All I can say is that I suppose it is because of the, uh, uh, the, the uh, fact that the, the skeletal structure is yet to be solidified and formed firmly that the, the, uh, the essence of that baby, the skin is much more tender, uh, everything is uh, less rugged than it would be with a 40-year-old human male. That would be my guess. It's almost more like, um, it's not entirely cartilage, but it's not, it's not bone in the way that an adult would Yeah, because yeah, there wasn't much left. Right, it, was just, it seems like it would be so much easier literally to consume. Yeah, well you saw the damage that the, the maggots did to the pig to disarticulate, and, and they, they are, they're voracious feeders. That's what they do. How is a, if vultures have picked the body clean, how does that affect the anthropological evidence? No, I, I couldn't hear. So please say again. If vultures have picked the body clean, how does that affect this evidence? Well, uh, you know, vultures are also a good, uh, a, a good decomposer organism. Uh, you know, you can... Uh, uh, you go to Tibet, and you know they, they don't like you to look at the sky burials, but uh, you know you can you can see them from a distance. When I was there, and you know the vultures can clean a skeleton. Uh, in uh, in Africa, they feed vultures all, all the time, so vultures can do a very good job. Vulture damage can be recognized by knowledgeable crime scene investigators. And vultures occasionally will, will pick at an individual and will leave marks that might be mistaken for knife wounds and things like that. But the, the, the maggots will generally outcompete the vultures or at least give them a run for their money. Yeah. All right, let's have another round of applause for our speaker. Thank you very much. Certainly. <laughs>